Good afternoon. My name is John Strope. I'd like to welcome you to the Brown Bag History Lecture Series sponsored by the History Department of the University of Nebraska at Kearney. The series is offered in partnership with the Nebraska State Historical Society. Lectures are held on the second Wednesday in selected months at the Kearney Public Library. The programs are taped before a live audience, are broadcast on public and government access channels in Lincoln, Omaha, Bellevue, Hastings, North Platte, Grand Island, Papillion, South Sioux City, and Beatrice, and are posted on YouTube. A schedule for this series, as well as information about all of the History Department's programs, can be found at www.unk.edu slash academics slash history. Check it out. Information about all of the Society's programs and services can be found at www.nebraskahistory.org. If you are not already a member, I encourage you to join. Benefits of membership include subscriptions to Nebraska History Magazine and the Society's newsletter. Use of a microfilm reader printer in the Society's library archives to make free copies from microfilm. Free admission to the Society's seven historic sites. Discounts in the Society's landmark stores at the History Museum in Lincoln, the State Capitol, and Chimney Rock. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the UNK History Department and the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast programs on public access cable channels across the state and on the Society's YouTube page. That page is at www.youtube.com slash user slash Nebraska Historical. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeff Wells, Assistant Professor of History at UNK. Dr. Wells is a native of Joplin, Missouri. He received his PhD in history from Texas Christian University. His specialties include the United States between 1877 and 1920, the West, the South, journalism, and military history. His research focuses on the journalists of the Farmers Alliance and People's Party of the 1890s. He is interested in the use of technology in historical research and dissemination, and he is the project director for Historic Kearney, a public digital history project of the UNK History Department. Prior to pursuing his doctoral degree, he served as a reporter at daily newspapers in Missouri and Kansas and as editor of a business journal. His topic is, The Most Interesting and Picturesque Fraud in the State of Nebraska, Paul Vandervoort and the Gilded Age Nebraska. Just to let you know about asking questions, Dr. Wells prefers waiting until the end unless you are just dying to ask. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wells. Thank you. In 2006, the Dolceki's brand of beer introduced an advertising campaign featuring the most interesting man in the world. The commercials depicted a handsome gentleman traveling the world, encountering historical figures and performing feats of heroism. In 1896, a Lincoln newspaper described Omaha resident Paul Vandervoort as the most interesting and picturesque fraud in the state of Nebraska. Obviously, unlike the beer company, the newspaper did not intend the comment as a compliment. But what made Vandervoort both interesting and picturesque and a fraud? Vandervoort's remarkable biography certainly made him interesting. He fought for the Union during the Civil War, endured confinement as a prisoner of war at the Confederacy's most notorious prisons, and served in an important patronage position under several Republican presidents. He influenced Omaha, Nebraska, and national politics. He was the first former enlisted man to serve as the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. He served as a lobbyist for the Union Pacific, 
but abandoned the Republican Party and rose to positions of prominence in the People's Party, the most successful third party movement since the Civil War. He helped control the Omaha Police and Fire Board of Commissioners on behalf of the Nativist American Protective Association. And near the end of his life, he abandoned the populist movement and helped establish the longest lasting American colony in Cuba. Available photos show why contemporaries considered Vandervoort picturesque. They show that he was tall with a robust physique. But his appeal extended beyond his physical appearance. His resume, particularly his term as national commander of the GAR, made him attractive to outsiders that wanted to lend his name and to whatever cause they were promoting, whether it was corporations lobbying for government contracts, Republican or populist candidates for office, or Brooklyn investors trying to sell parcels of land in Cuba. But despite being among the most well-known Nebraskans during his lifetime, his neighbors in the state tended to regard him with more suspicion than did outsiders, and with good reason. Historians describe the Gilded Age, the period of American history from the close of the Civil War to approximately 1900, as an era, era filled with corruption, politicians accepting bribes, and domineering capitalists. The lingering sectional tensions and memories of the Civil War dominated the era's politics. Vandervoort's biography provides an opportunity to introduce and explore several events, conflicts, and controversies that shaped politics and government in Nebraska and the United States during the late 19th century. Vandervoort boasted that his family was among New York's earliest settlers. However, his ancestors later moved to Virginia and then Ohio. He was born July 2nd, or excuse me, July 12th, 1846 in Ohio, and 10 years later moved with his family to Illinois. He was 15 years old and a student at Illinois Wesleyan University at the outbreak of the Civil War. He tried three times to join the Army before he finally succeeded in enrolling in the 68th Illinois Infantry in 1862. While the regiment guarded Washington, D.C., Vandervoort, eager for action, left his unit without permission and participated in the Second Battle of Bull Run in August 1862. When his enlistment in the 68th Illinois Infantry expired, he joined the 16th Illinois Cavalry. In September 1863, Confederate guerrillas captured Vandervoort while his unit patrolled the Cumberland Gap. His captors debated executing him before sending him to Bristol, Virginia. He then spent three months imprisoned at Bell Island in Richmond, Virginia, six months at Andersonville in Georgia, and a month at another prison in Georgia before being paroled in June 1864. Of the 312 men captured with Vandervoort, 154 died in prison. Weakened by his ordeal, Vandervoort convalesced in, Arlington, in Annapolis, Maryland, and in Illinois. He rejoined his unit near the end of the Civil War. After the Civil War, on May 7, 1868, Vandervoort married Amanda N. Ware, a niece of Supreme Court Justice Samuel F. Miller. Miller was a Republican appointed to the court by President Abraham Lincoln. Vandervoort tried to enter politics as a Republican and sought a county office in McLean County, Illinois. In 1873, no doubt aided by the connections of his wife's uncle, he received an appointment from the administration of President Ulysses S. Grant as the chief clerk of the Railway Mail Service at Omaha. In this role, he supervised the mail traveling over the transcontinental Railroad. An 1876 incident sparked a long and acrimonious rivalry between Vandervoort and Edward Rosewater, the editor and publisher of the Omaha Bee. The trouble started with an article published in the Bee regarding how police identified two robbery suspects. Here I quote, Sparks and Newton were known to have been out on a spree during all Saturday night, spending money freely and bucking the tiger at a colored den on Douglas Street. Richard Curry, an African-American politician, objected to his business being described as, quote, a colored den, and challenged Rosewater from the pages of the Omaha Republican. 
Rosewater responded by noting that although the article did not name Curry's business, his response indicated that his enterprise must have met the description. Rosewater said that his newspaper supported equal rights for African Americans, and that meant that they would be held to the same high moral standards expected from white-owned businesses. A week later, Curry waited for Rosewater outside the federal courthouse, and when the editor emerged from the building, Curry attacked him with a club. Smith Coffey, a friend of Curry's, tried to stop the assault. Rosewater briefly broke away, but Curry chased him. A crowd finally assembled and stopped the attack. A doctor attended to Rosewater while police arrested Curry and Coffey and charged them with attempted murder. The two men's greatest crime, however, may have been challenging the race-based limits established by white Omaha. The Herald said that Curry, a former barber, enjoyed the respect of whites and blacks, and he evidently knew his place and kept it until participating in politics. Some white Republicans, the Herald wrote, believed that he could influence black voters and courted his favor. Curry soon found himself sitting on grand juries and among whites at the theater. Soon after the attack, rumors started to circulate that a conspiracy of leading white Republicans organized the attack with Curry and Coffee acting as tools. William J. Connell, who would go on to serve in Congress, was the district attorney that investigated the case. Upon completing his investigation, Connell sent a letter to Postmaster General Marshall Jewell reporting that sworn testimony of several witnesses indicated that the Omaha Postmaster and Vandervoort had concocted a plot to create the rivalry between Curry and Rosewater and in an attempt to incite violence between the two. The two postal officials allegedly directed someone to insert the item, purportedly from Curry, into the Omaha Republican. The article appeared and both Rosewater and Curry fell for the trap. Connell reported to Jewell that although he lacked sufficient evidence to prosecute, Vandervoort took an active part in the conspiracy. The, post the federal post office investigated Vandervoort's connection to the assault, but did not punish him. Rosewater, however, hounded Vandervoort for more than 25 years. After Vandervoort's exoneration by postal officials, Rosewater accused Vandervoort of period periodical drunkenness and disreputable debaucheries, allowing unsworn persons to handle the mail and deadbeats to ride in the mail cars, forcing mail clerks to participate in bond elections, aiding in a lottery swindle at Laramie, Wyoming, and encouraging the plot against Rosewater. The Omaha Bee, Rosewater's paper, concluded that Vandervoort was officially reckless, incompetent, unreliable, and a morally infamous scoundrel. The newspaper wrote, whether these disclosures result in Mr. Vandervoort's removal or whether the department shall see fit to ignore and retain him, the people of Omaha and Nebraska must henceforth view Paul Vandervoort as an infamous character who, if he had his just desserts, would wear a zebra suit behind the bars of the Nebraska Penitentiary. The incident, however, failed to damage Vandervoort's reputation and standing within the local, state, and national Republican parties. And he retained his position for the duration of the administration of President Rutherford B. Hayes. Although both Vandervoort and Rosewater belonged to the Republican Party, Vandervoort associated with a local clique believed to be favorable to the Union Pacific. Now this clique was probably aligned with the stalwart faction of Republicans on the national level, a group that favored the patronage system. Factional disputes within the Republican Party are nothing new or unique to the 21st century. Rosewater belonged to a reform-minded faction, most likely associated at the national level with a group known as the Half-Breeds. They were willing to support regulating the railroad. In 1880, Vandervoort supported former President Ulysses S. Grant's bid for the Republican presidential nomination. 
However, Rosewater and the Nebraska delegation to the 1880 National Convention supported James G. Blaine. Neither, uh, neither Blaine nor Grant would win the nomination. James A. Garfield, with Blaine's support, eventually won the nomination over Grant after 36 rounds of balloting. When Garfield won the presidency, Rosewater and the B hoped that the new president would select a postmaster general that would remove Vandervoort from his patronage post, but he kept his job and remained a popular Republican speaker and a member of the party's state central committee. The Brownville, Nebraska advertiser viewed him as a very well qualified and staunch Republican and true as steel. Some Nebraskans viewed him as a possible candidate for Congress in 1882. In addition to the Nebraska Republican Party, Vandervoort served in leadership positions for the Grand Army of the Republic. The Grand Army of the Republic was a fraternal organization for Union veterans of the Civil War. Vandervoort organized GAR posts in Illinois and Ohio and served in leadership positions immediately following the war. Upon his removal to Nebraska, he received an appointment as the provisional commander of the state and with the responsibility of organizing new posts. Although Union veterans filled Nebraska, Vandervoort faced a few challenges in organizing the state. The men, mostly immigrants from eastern states, had served in different units from different states during the war and lacked the cohesiveness and shared experience of members of Eastern J.R. Post. Also, the order's involvement with politics tainted its reputation. Despite these challenges, Nebraska soon boasted 97 posts with a total membership of 3,000. He spoke on the J.R.'s behalf, or excuse me, Vandervoort's success in organizing Nebraska fueled his rise up the order's national ranks. He spoke on the GAR's behalf in Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Kansas. He finished second in the 1881 election to be national commander. And he won election as national commander-in-chief of the Grand Army of the Republic during the order's June 1888, excuse me, June 1882 encampment at Baltimore. The Columbus Journal viewed the order's 1882 election of Vandervoort as an honor and victory for all of Nebraska. Vandervoort appeared at GAR events on the Plains, the Midwest, New England, and as far west as California. It will be seen that his engagements are as numerous as those of a stump speaker in a hot political campaign, wrote the National Tribune, the GAR's official newspaper, his heart is in the work and his enthusiasm is likely to beget enthusiasm in his comrades. Vandervoort encouraged GAR members to recruit other veterans to the order and to open new posts. He sponsored a contest to promote the order's growth and the National Tribune claimed that the order reached his goal of 50,000 new recruits in only six months. In addition, his accomplishments as, as commander included organizing the Women's Relief Corps, an auxiliary organization. His term ended at the 1883 National Encampment at Denver, Colorado. Vandervoort claimed that Postmaster General Timothy Howell, appointed by President Chester Arthur after Garfield's assassination, gave him permission to be absent from Omaha and his postal duties to serve the GAR. But when Howe died, his successor, Walter Q. Gresham, dismissed Vandervoort from his position as the chief clerk of the Railway Mail Service because of numerous absences during his time as the GAR's commander. Vandervoort claimed he made only one trip and with permission and without pay under Gresham, and he complained that he only learned of his dismissal when his successor walked into the department. According to the post office, however, Vandervoort missed 265 days from office in the year that ended July 31st, 1883, most in service to the GAR. Clerks performed some of Vandervoort's duties during his absences, but many of his obligations were entirely neglected. 
Superiors reported that his absence demoralized service in his section and the division superintendent had warned him against being gone. Vandervoort had promised to return to duty at Omaha immediately following the end of the Denver meeting, but instead he went to Soda Springs, Idaho and remained there until he was fired. His record in the department for a long time has been one of continued disregard of orders, a report said. Rosewater cheered Vandervoort's dismissal. For if there ever was a low-down, contemptible railroad surf in existence, Vandervoort is that one, and had it not been for Justice Miller, a Supreme Court judge, your good state would not have been cursed with his presence for as long as it was, a Kansas correspondent wrote to the Bee. Vandervoort tried to use his influence in the GAR and his connections in Washington to demand his reinstatement or Postmaster Gresham's removal. Congressman William Rosecrans of California, a Democrat and former Union general, defended Vandervoort, but the New York Times predicted Vandervoort's appeals to old soldiers would fall on deaf ears, as it is in the essence of patriotism to demand the faithful performance of every public duty. The fact that Vandervoort is trying to kick up a fuss proves that he should have been removed as an unfit man for any responsible position wrote the Salt Lake City Daily Herald. Vandervoort, the Salt Lake City paper wrote, cavorted around the country making political speeches believing a Republican administration would not fire the head of the Grand Army of the Republic. To presume in this manner is scandalous, reflecting as it does upon the honesty and integrity of the GAR and giving that organization a political feature which it has always denied, the Herald wrote. Vandervoort appealed directly to Gresham, and Gresham refused to reinstate Vandervoort, saying that he believed the GAR would not want one of its men shrinking from duty and disobeying orders while in the service of the federal government. You have, by this act, sir, assassinated your future political prospects. Vandervoort told Gresham. Meanwhile, back in Nebraska, GAR Post debated whether to support Vandervoort. Omaha's Custer Post, Vandervoort's home post, passed resolutions critical of him. But outside the state, Vandervoort remained popular among his GAR comrades. He provided the National Tribune with reports from the 1884 National Encampment. During the 1886 National Encampment, Vandervoort made a fiery speech that condemned Democratic President Grover Cleveland's decision to lower the flag to half-mast upon the death of a former U.S. Secretary of the Interior that had resigned to join the Confederate government. Cleveland's 1884 election had gave the Democratic Party control of the White House for the first time since the Civil War. With no hope of regaining his patronage position with the Democrats in power, Vandervoort immersed himself in local and state politics, not as a candidate, but as a lobbyist and operative. The Omaha Bee reported that Vandervoort joined the Union Pacific lobbyist at Lincoln for the opening of the 1887 legislative session. Calling the state capitol infested with drunken bummers and boodlers, Rosewater wondered who paid Vandervoort's hotel bill. In April 1887, Rosewater accused Vandervoort of leading a gang intended to capture control of the Omaha city elections. Honest men should keep an eye on Paul Vandervoort until after the primaries if they va value clean government. By the way, who employs Mr. Vanderbum now? And what is his business? The Bee wrote. The Omaha Republican, however, tried to promote Vandervoort's reputation. The Bear Blair pilot, however, rejected the Republicans' attempts to rescue Vandervoort's name. The Omaha Republican exhibits bad taste in trying to bolster up such a shystering fraud and blatherskite as Paul Vandervoort. The pilot said it would be impossible for the Republican to convince the Nebraska public that Paul Vandervoort is anything but a deadbeat fraud and blatherskite, 
unless there is something more disgraceful and degrading that he can be. Throughout the late 19th century, the Grand Army of the Republic operated as a political arm of the Republican Party, despite the misgivings of some members that wanted to see the organization remain nonpartisan. At the GAR's 1887 national encampment, Vandervoort introduced a resolution condemning Cleveland's policies towards Union veterans. He denounced the president's positions on pensions for widows and orphans of veterans. Cleveland's efforts to return captured Confederate flags to the southern states met his ire, and the president's appointment of ex-Confederates to offices was denounced. Under the heading, Vanderbum's Bomb, Rosewater wrote that Paul Vandervoort has thrown a bomb into the Grand Army of the Republic camp, and his insane desire for notoriety has again been gratified. Vandervoort's nemesis claimed that Vandervoort had shot principally with his big mouth and was never with re within reach of a bombshell or a gunshot during the entire war. His whole army record consists of being a quartermaster's clerk at Alexandria, getting himself captured by rebels in Kentucky later on, and being carried off to Andersonville and then paroled. Rosewater wrote, that Vandervoort had won election as national commander merely as a courtesy to those Union vets moving westward after the war. It's very unfortunate that such an errant blowhard should be allowed to thrust himself forward as the spokesman of gallant soldiers who went through the hardships of four years campaigning. Vandervoort spent the winter of 1887, 1888 in Washington, D.C., acting as a lobbyist for stone and granite quarries, bidding to build the basement and first floor of the Library of Congress building. He left D.C. for Nebraska on May 26, 1888, accompanied by Supreme Court Justice Miller. In June 1888, Vandervoort went to Chicago for the Republican National Convention. There he actively opposed the candidacy of Walter Q. Gresham, the former Postmaster General that had dismissed Vandervoort in 1883. Gresham represented a reform-minded wing of the party and received support from the members of the Patrons of Husbandry, also known as the Grange, the Farmers Alliance, and the Agricultural Wheel. An Omaha Bee correspondent described Vandervoort as a bloodthirsty veteran who never came within a thousand miles of a battle. In Chicago, the paper claimed, Vandervoort joined with railroad interest trying to defeat Gresham. Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of former President William Henry Harrison, won the Republican nomination. Outside of Nebraska, far from, Vander, or far from Rosewater's influence, Vandervoort continued to earn praise. The Indianapolis Journal lauded his work on behalf of veterans, calling him an ardent friend of the soldier. Indiana's Republican State Committee arranged for him to speak in the state in advance of the November 1888 election. He called on Harrison, Vandervoort called on Harrison at the Republican nominee's Indianapolis home on April, October 14, 1888, and in the campaign's final weeks, he visited Connecticut, Michigan, and New York on behalf of Harrison and the Republican Party. Vandervoort expected Harrison's victory over Cleveland to return him to a choice patronage position. He again visited Harrison's Indianapolis home in January 1889 before spending the rest of the winter in Washington, D.C. There he received as an, an appointment as an assistant secretary to the Republican National Committee. James McDowell, a former railway mail service superintendent, visited Vandervoort at Washington, D.C. and said that he hoped that Vandervoort would be appointed as general superintendent of the entire railway mail service the organization that served the entire country. I hope it is so, McDowell said. I want this appointment made as if it were a matter personal to myself, because I want you to be able to snap your fingers in the face of that Indian in Gresham, who so unjustly and meanly used his position to trouble and distress an army comrade. A St. Paul, Minnesota Daily Globe correspondent claimed that Vandervoort's national popularity continued to rise. Vandervoort again called on Harrison in Washington, D.C. before the inauguration and urged the president-elect to support a pension bill in his inaugural address. 
Vandervoort also formally asked Harrison to be appointed as General Superintendent of the Railway Mail Service, a significant promotion compared to the job that he had lost about four years earlier. Newspaper reports suggested that Postmaster General John Wanamaker, of, Defar of department store fame and wealth, planned to appoint Vandervoort to the post. However, Vandervoort's enemies, no doubt including Edward Rosewater, submitted a lengthy letter detailing the circumstances surrounding his 1883 removal and allegations regarding his service as a lobbyist for the Union Pacific to Wanamaker. The campaign may have succeeded as Vandervoort did not receive the general superintendent position. Instead, he received an appointment as a superintendent of mails at Omaha, basically his old job by a new name. Vandervoort's responsibilities as superintendent of the mails included seeing that clerks properly handled the mail, examining the reports of railway postal clerks, and tracing errors. The appointment of a superintendent marked a reorganization at Omaha as the chief clerk, Vandervoort's old job, had previously handled similar duties. During the 1890s, Vandervoort aligned himself with William J. Broach, a two-time mayor of Omaha that Rosewater accused of operating a political machine. In January 1890, Rosewater called Vandervoort a bummer for, for, who, a bummer for who for years acted as a procurer for the railroads in the legislative oil rooms, in which members were debauched with drink and from which they were often led into the meshes of bribe, bribe givers through houses of ill repute. The county attorney filed a criminal libel charge against Edward Rosewater on January 7, 1890, after Vandervoort filed a complaint following the appearance of the article. Rosewater responded by complaining about Vandervoort and J.C. Wilcox, the editor of the Republican, prompting the Douglas County prosecutor to also charge them with criminal libel. While the prosecution tried to show that the bee intended to libel Vandervoort by linking him to oil rooms, Rosewater's attorney tried to prove that Vandervoort acted as a corporate lobbyist while also receiving a government salary. The prosecutor eventually dropped all of the cases. Despite the bitter factional disputes, involving personalities like Vandervoort and Rosewater, the Republican Party controlled Nebraska politics from statehood on March 1, 1867 until 1890. In that year, a third party, the Independent Party, formed with support of members of Nebraska's 1,200 local chapters of the Far Farmers Alliance and allied labor groups. The Independent Party, which would merge with the National People's Party, also known as the Populist Party, in 1892, won a majority in the state legislature in the 1890 election and won four of the state's five congressional seats. The turmoil created by the third party allowed the Democratic candidate, James E. Boyd, to win the gubernatorial election. Boyd was the first Democrat elected governor since statehood. The Republican candidate finished third. And that's when Nebraska had its birther controversy. Vandervoort presided at a January 1891 meeting of the Douglas County Republican League that supported outgoing Republican Governor John Milton Thayer's refusal to yield his office to Governor-elect James E. Boyd. Thayer and the Republicans contended that the Irish-born Democrat Boyd was not a citizen and was thus not eligible to serve in the office. Boyd eventually appealed the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. He won. However, by the time he prevailed, only a few months left were left in his two-year term. However, with the Republicans out of power in Nebraska, Vandervoort's influence in Lincoln would diminish. In, addi in addition, Justice Miller, his wife's uncle, and Vandervoort's patron in Washington, had died in October 1890. Vandervoort announced his secession from the Republican Party and affiliation with the Independent Party in March 1891. This is an acquisition to which the independents are welcome, wrote the Bee. The Republicans of Nebraska can truthfully exclaim, good riddance of bad rubbish. The Bee, 
the B claimed that Vandervoort and his corrupt ilk had caused the Alliance uprising and the independent victory in the first place. But the independent victory and Miller's death were not the only reasons that Vandervoort left the GOP. The Bee reported that s about six weeks earlier, a special agent had reported to Postmaster General John Wanamaker that Vandervoort was in Lincoln lobbying the legislature while still drawing a salary as superintendent of the mails at Omaha. Vandervoort resigned to avoid another ouster. The Bee speculated that the incident explained Vandervoort's sudden departure from the Republican Party. Vandervoort continued to serve as a paid lobbyist for the telephone and telegraph companies at the 1891 legislative session, despite independent calls for regulating those industries. The B speculated that he continued to lobby legislatures on uh, legislators on behalf of the railroads, another industry that the Farmers Alliance sought to regulate, while delivering speeches on behalf of the Independent Party. Vandervoort, of course, gave different reasons for his departure. I'm going to leave a party which in this state represents a streak of rust exuding from the iron bands of 5,000 miles of railway and has for its foundation the rotten revenues robbing, blackmailing band of cormorants and vultures of the penitentiary ring. I'm going to join a party where frauds like John Wanamaker cannot buy a cabinet office with the largest contribution to the campaign fund. Vandervoort's defection from the Republican Party to the Independents made headlines across Nebraska. The Independent backing Schuyler Quill bemoaned Vandervoort's arrival. Our congratulations to the party of Lincoln and Grant and Blaine. Your gain is our loss. Sympathies, please. The Republican-leaning Carney Hub said that Vandervoort's departure caused neither sorrow nor anger among Republicans. 20 years service as a Republican camp follower and a holder of fat offices with nothing to do equips him admirably to be a shining light among the alliancers, the hub wrote. Outside of Nebraska, however, the story was Paul Vandervoort, the GAR leader, deserts the Republican Party. Vandervoort quickly rose to positions of prominence in the People's Party. In the weeks before the party's first nominating convention at Omaha in July 1892, supporters unsuccessfully campaigned for Vandervoort to be the party's first nominee for vice president. After the leading candidate for the populist presidential nomination died just weeks before the convention, party officials scrambled to find a replacement. Federal Judge Walter Q. Gresham, the former Postmaster General, that had fired Vandervoort in 1883, was interested in the populist nomination. Gresham, who had grown dissatisfied with the Republican Party after his defeat, partially at Vandervoort's hands, at the 1888 convention, told supporters he would accept the People's Party's nomination if, only if, it was unanimous. Vandervoort, a delegate to the convention, made it clear he would never support Gresham. Thus, the convention never considered him, so Vandervoort made good on his promise to assassinate Gresham's political career by twice denying him, working to deny him a presidential nomination. In November 1892, party leaders appointed Vandervoort as the commander of the Industrial Legion, a populist labor organization modeled after the GAR. Vandervoort continued to be involved in municipal politics in Omaha while serving the National People's Party. In 1895, the, the Nativist American Protective Association pushed lawmakers to strip Governor Silas Holcomb, a populist, of the authority to appoint commissioners of the Omaha Police and Fire Board. Instead, the APA wanted the Republican Attorney General and land commissioner to make the appointments. Holcomb sued after the APA offic favored officials named Vandervoort and two Republicans to the board. The incident placed Vandervoort at odds with a governor elected with populist support and raised questions about his true political allegiance. 
But Van der Voort's importance within the People's Party continued to grow, and it reached its zenith with his February 1896 election as president of the National Reform Press Association, the national organization for populist journalists. Despite only tenuous claims that he had ever worked as a newspaper man. In addition to providing professional development opportunities for editors, the NRPA distributed editorial content favored, uh, favorable towards populist candidates and encouraged the start of new populist newspapers. The NRPA also served an important recruiting and organizational function for the People's Party. Leadership of the NRPA gave Van der Voort significant influence over the future of the People's Party and the populist movement. Van der Voort allied himself with a radical Texas-based faction of the People's Party that refused to cooperate with the Republican, Republicans or Democrats. After his election as NRPA president, Van der Voort embarked on a speaking tour of Texas, of Texas with Jacob S. Coxey. Coxey had led unemployed workers in a widely publicized protest march on Washington, D.C. in 1894. Van der Voort greeted Coxey when he, when he arrived at Omaha aboard a Pullman car in May 1896. While in Omaha, Coxey stayed at the luxurious Paxton Hotel. It is this encounter that prompted the Lincoln Courier to write, while Coxey is engaged in the other, telling the other fellows how poor they are, he always takes the best there is for himself. When the tramps of his army were trudging along on foot, he rode in a carriage behind milk white steeds. In Omaha, Coxey sought out that familiar spirit, Paul Vandervoort, the most interesting and picturesque fraud in the state of Nebraska. The middle of the road faction. Those populist opposed to cooperation with the Republicans or Democrats through a political tactic known as fusion, favored Vandervoort as their first choice for president, leading up to the People's Party's 1896 convention at St. Louis. After the fusionists gained control and installed Nebraska's U.S. Senator William Vincent Allen, an, advocation of, an advocate of fusion or cooperation with the Democrats as chairman, Vandervoort was the only Nebraska populist at the convention to oppose Democratic nominee William Jennings, Jennings Bryan's nomination on the People's Party ticket. We denounce Paul Vandervoort as a traitor whose sole object is to defeat Bryan, wrote the Nebraska People's Party State Central Committee. His reputation for 20 years has been that of a railroad capper around the Nebraska legislature. He has been excluded from all populist convention conventions in the state. He holds an office by the gift of the Republicans, and we warn our friends of Bryan to be aware of him. As NRPA president, Vandervoort drove a deeper wedge between the two factions of the People's Party. For the party to survive and prosper, the fusionist and mill of the roaders needed to reach an accord following Bryan's 1896 defeat. Instead, the rivalry between Vandervoort and the leaders of the fusionist press split the NRPA at just the moment the movement needed an organized infrastructure. After the decline of the People's Party, Vandervoort helped establish an American colony, La Gloria, in Cuba. He conducted much of the preparation work from his Omaha office. Vandervoort, the company's assistant manager, went to Cuba to take charge of the firm's business and to settle there himself. Described as geni ge genial and stalwart, Van Vandervoort brought with him more than 20 settlers from Nebraska, Iowa, and Kansas, including several of his neighbors from Omaha. His private secretary described him as honest, affable, and humorous a magnetic and convincing speaker with a sunny nature singularly free from affection and ardently loyal to his friends. These qualities made Vandervoort a natural leader of men, well fitted to head a colonizing expedition. Settlers at the colony included Union veterans of the Civil War, many who wore GAR ribbons, and veterans of the Spanish-American War, including some who had participated in the invasion of the island. The colonists cheered when the company's officers in Brooklyn elected Vandervoort as its president. 
The colonists had full faith in his honesty and devotion to the colony, and hence looked upon his election as the, of the, uh, to the presidency of the company as the best possible security for the success of the enterprise, his former secretary wrote. Vandervoort directly participated in the governance of the colony. He established a U.S. post office and pro prohibited the sale of liquor to settlers. La Gloria eventually grew to be the largest American colony in Cuba. Vandervoort, however, did not live to see it prosper. He died on July 29, 1902 at Port-au-Prince, Cuba. He was buried in Omaha nearly three years later. When his body reached Omaha on April 5, 1906, the Grand Army of the Republic escorted the casket to Forest Lawn Cemetery for burial. Vandervoort was a well-known Nebraskan during his lifetime, but is almost forgotten by historians. His career, particularly his association with the American Protective Association, may challenge prevailing interpretations of populism. The populist movement and the People's Party it spawned aimed to heal the sectional divide between the North and South and to use government power to aid Southern and Western farmers and laborers instead of Eastern capitalists. Since the mid-20th century, however, the populists are often remembered by the public and the press as xenophobic and racist. Paul Vandervoort's emergence as a national populist leader provides evidence to support this negative view of populism. However, a close examination of Vandervoort's entire career and the attitudes of his neighbors in Nebraska reveal that while interesting and attractive on the surface, he embodied the worst stereotypes of Gilded Age political corruption and that the mainstream of Nebraska populists rejected his views. Before I answer questions, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society for a research grant to support my research into Vandervoort and for scanning some of the photos I used in my presentation. I also thank the Society and my colleagues in the Department of History at UNK for arranging this lecture series. Thank you for attending, especially to my Nebraska history students. So I'll now take some questions from the audience. So the question is, what was Vandervoort's association with the American Protective Association? At the time that Vandervoort was appointed to the Omaha Police and Fire Commission by the Republican Attorney General and Land Commissioner over the objections of populist Governor Silas Holcomb, Vandervoort also served as editor of the Omaha American, a newspaper uh, published by the APA. So it is, this is his tenuous link to journalism that I mentioned. And whether he actually participated actively in the production of the newspaper is unclear, but Vandervoort did uh, affiliate and associate himself with the nativist and anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic views of the APA. One thing we are, uh, the question is, did Vandervoort's views change when he went to Cuba? Probably you're, you're, you're hearing the description of him by his former secretary and thinking, well, this guy sounds a lot better than the guy that was in Nebraska. Unfortunately, historians do not know of a deposit of, of Vandervoort's papers or a diary or anything. So we, we don't know a lot about what he actually thought himself. I suspect his views did not change other than his affiliation returned to the Republican Party when he moved to Cuba. How active were the American colonies in Cuba, specifically Vandervoort's rule? The, the question is, how active were the American colonies in Cuba? So after the Spanish-American Philippine War, there was an effort to settle Americans, Norte Americanos, I guess, uh, in this case, citizens of the United States in Cuba. And the uh, effort that Vandervoort joined was one that was not officially sanctioned by the government, that, but had been arranged by land speculators. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and so uh, he participated it, he, in it. He used his uh, reputation of being a former national commander of the GAR to help promote the colony. And then he went there and uh, 
participated in the governance of the colony. His son and uh, other members of his family joined him there and also acted as surveyors on the project. This, they created out of basically the jungle a thriving community that persisted uh, until the 1940s when the second and third generation uh, of Americans there left, came back to the United States long before the Cuban Revolution. But it persisted for several decades. The question is, do I have a sense of, of Vandervoort's personal wealth? I know that when he was head of the Industrial Legion, the populist labor organization, he was constantly sending letters to populist newspapers asking for members to send in their dues, saying that he had uh, risked his family's own finances to support the organizing of the Industrial Legion. And so I suspect, particularly throughout the 18... Uh, 90s, Van der Voort was struggling to, uh, to pay his bills. I, I never get the sense that he used any of his positions to accumulate vast personal wealth. I think he struggled pretty much his whole adult life. Yeah, so that's a great question. What took so long for his body to uh, go from Cuba to back to burial in Omaha? I don't know. That, that's something that my research hasn't uncovered. Um, I don't know if he was initially buried in, in Cuba. I suspect that he was. Uh, and then his body was removed once uh, they made arrangements. I suspect the GAR may have helped pay for the uh, body to be removed back to Omaha but uh, I have not yet found evidence of that. When I think of populism, I think, I think of William Jennings Bryan. What was the connection of, of uh, Vandervoort and William Jennings Bryan? Okay, so the question is, what was the connection between uh, Paul Vandervoort and William Jennings Bryan, famous Nebraskan of the time period, and uh, what was Vandervoort's role with the populist, or what was William Jennings Bryan's role with the populist movement? So, Vandervoort is the one member of the Nebraska delegation to the 1896 Populist National Convention to oppose William Jennings Bryan's nomination as the People's Party nominee. What happened in 1896 is the People's Party made a decision to hold its convention third. The Republicans met in St. Louis and, as expected, nominated William McKinley, an advocate of the gold standard, for the presidency. The populists expected that the Democrats, which met a couple of weeks later in Chicago, would also nominate a candidate that favored the gold standard. President Grover Cleveland, the sitting Democratic president, favored the gold standard and had economic policies very similar to that of, uh, William, of William McKinley. But William Jennings Bryan, a former congressman from Nebraska, went to Chicago and delivered his famous Cross of Gold speech. The speech convinced the Democratic Party to nominate Bryan for president. And so with the Democratic party in favor of moving away from the gold standard, adopting the coinage of silver, currency inflation, that meant that the People's Party had lost their most appealing issue. And so the populists went into their convention in St. Louis in turmoil. Were they going to nominate a candidate of their own and risk splitting the free silver vote and handing the election to McKinley? Or could they get behind Bryan, a Democrat, and support him? And that's the controversy that, that tore the party apart at the convention. And Vandervoort was among those that refused to accept the nomination of Bryan as the People's Party candidate. Now, it's important to note that Bryan was not a populist. Bryan was not a member of the People's Party, despite Bryan receiving the populist nomination for the presidency. And so they had to kind of negotiate a careful balancing act 
William Vincent Allen, Nebraska's U.S. Senator, the chairman of the uh, People's Party 1896 National Convention, was a personal friend of Bryan's. And so instead of asking him to accept the nomination, they told him, you are the nominee, we're just going to notify you. We're not going to actually ask you if you want it. You're just going to be, be it, okay? So that's how they worked through that. But Brian was not a populist, but, and, but Vandervoort was the only Nebraska populist to, to oppose his nomination. Okay, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.